Hello Catherine, there you are. You've got an introduction in musical form. Anyway, question number one you asked me was an important one from my point of view about the difference between part one, part two and part three. Part one is has a name, the image. Part two, the word. Part three is word plus image. You ask me why part three seems so different in form and in so many other different ways and it's a good question because it's quite deliberate that it is so. So starting with the film in part one I called it the image because the principle there was that part one would be about the camera. If you're going to make a film you need a camera. You need the image. You take it from outside elsewhere you have a camera like an eye that looks and sees. That's your basic material. Part one then is camera, image. Part two is where you take the image and you do something with it. In other words you think about it or you write about it. You actually cut it up. You edit. And there is in fact a kind of dissonance, a very strong dissonance between the two, the word and the image, and that's what you play with when you make an experimental film, the kind of film that I make. You do actually play with the idea of the difference between the straightforward image, which is quite pure in a way, and then what you do with it. In part two you see the image being cut on an editing machine. Part three is totally different for a very important reason is that I have thought about it that part one and part two are in dissonance I thought right part three has got to be fused it's got to be brought together the word and the image has got to be brought together and it's brought together in Columbia University because finally it's possible to make the film pure again because it is filming a situation that is beyond my control, beyond anybody's control actually. The word and the image are finally together and I decided the best way to make that clear was to do it as if it was a straightforward documentary. It was only when I started to edit it that I decided to put my voice over. So we have an experimental part one, which is the image. What is the camera looking for? What am I looking for? Then part two is what am I doing on the editing machine? Cutting it all up, asking questions, showing that film can be manipulated. Part three is where the film is subject to the unity of word and image in a collective situation where I and the students of Columbia University are finally at one together. We are a commune. The, what is seen and what is thought and what is heard and what is spoken hopefully has become one. And that is where the film ends. Gola, ya gorla, Бабы тело как колокол пила на площади голой я гоя о грозди возмездия звезал пом на запад я пепел не званого горя на небо сбил крепкие звезды как гвой. That was a few notes of Schoenberg, of course. Either that or I leant too heavily onto my piano here. 
All right, Catherine, here goes. I have been asked by Catherine Hamilton to say a few words about my film, The Fall, and um, I'm happy to do that. Very unhappy, I might say, that I can't be there in America. I can't be down in Kettering, which is only five miles away at the moment, so I'm in a wheelchair and goodness knows what else, paying the price of being in the 60s, I suppose, as many of us did. Anyway, the fall um, has been shown on a couple of occasions in the past in a similar kind of context to here and now. I'll come on to those a bit later. I have been given a series of questions. Let me put this piano off. I have been asked, given a number of questions by Catherine, and I'll do my best to answer them. I will repeat the question, first of all, and then launch into it. By the way, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the two people on the stage who've been um, exposed to the terror of standing in front of a huge audience, I hope it's a huge audience, and wondering um, what effect they will have on an audience. The great thing about making as a film normally, of course, is you make it and the only audience is yourself on an editing machine, and then later maybe an audience once or twice. A film like mine, which is an independent film, has not been widely shown and the subject matter has been um, quite often a difficult one for authorities, let's call them, to deal with. Anyway, here it is, this film, made four to six years ago, going to be shown in New York, as far as I can see, as part of a play that I don't know too much about, to be honest. Catherine says that, where is it? Uh, the relationship between image and action. Well, it's an important question because, um, obviously, it's important to Catherine, it's an important to the fact that um, the play that is going to be the background to the film is more on that particular subject. But Catherine and I have been talking about my film The Fall and showings of it for quite some time. So she is aware that it has always been for me two things. One, a film that I made running around New York, never knowing what the heck was going to happen next over a period of several months, dashing out of America with all the films sent privately so it wouldn't be um, <clears throat> intercepted by the CIA, and coming back to England and editing it and making sense of it. People now look at the film and they say, oh gosh, well it all hangs together, it's got images which speak for themselves, and it's got other ways of images and selves in the film speaking, actors, actresses, all kinds of people are in it, but it's a finished object, it's a finished film. Um, you don't have that concept at all when you're making the kind of film that I was making anyway, and the kind of work that I did. I was what they called it, making films direct cinema. I had no idea when I started filming The Fall what it was going to be. I was asked by two people if, after the success of my film at the New York Film Festival, Tonight Let's All Make Love in London, could I make a film called Tonight Let's All Make Love in New York? Well, I rather doubted I could. I'd been in New York not too long, but I didn't see quite this connection between New York at that particular moment and swinging London. But of course I said yes, there was money there, <clears throat> I hoped, and I was fascinated about filming New York. I had always been fascinated by New York, American movies, that kind of thing. But I, by this time, by the time I made The Fall, had been an independent Cinema Verite, direct cinema filmmaker. Which means that somebody rang me up and said they've occupied Columbia University. I grab my camera, sling, sling on a coat and a hat and go there and film. I have no idea what's going to happen. Throughout the whole of the making of The Fall, 
which is in, but from the autumn to later on, in, in March or whatever it was, I had no idea what was going to happen next. I had no idea how I was going to put it all together. I wasn't entirely sure whether I could ever do that very thing. I had to go back to Paris for three weeks just to sit and try and write a script at one point because I was falling apart into so many possibilities. I was documenting what was happening outside of myself. I ended up with 50 hours of film back in England. I then had to decide what kind of film I was going to make. Never once while I'm actually making it, when I was still working with a camera, which is creating the image, occasionally working with people, but not often, I was largely a wanderer dashing around with a camera, looking out for anything that was happening in New York at that time, which I felt related to what I was doing as a filmmaker. And that was questioning, seriously questioning, doubting and questioning the right to get up and say, here's my film, got a beginning, part one, part two and part three, it's the truth, I'd like you to see it. So what? Who's interested in, who really should care about what I consider to be the truth in a film I've just shot? It, it, it's just an arrogant, total kind of arrogant. Um, and I was, had reached the point where I, I was making a film, films for myself. I was beginning to seriously doubt making a film about the collapse of legal protests in America, but I pressed on and made the film because I realized that from my earliest films I was interested in the very question that this play, now four to six years later, is, I believe, asking. That is, you take, take a photograph or you film something and you put it out it then ceases to be part of you, really. It's then floating, free-floating out there for people to absorb or not absorb and decide what to do about it. I had always made films based on the idea of it being something that hurt. The film that hurt me most which I'd seen years before, was the film shot by a German soldier inside the Warsaw Ghetto, filming the collapse of the ghetto and the people therein dying, being filmed. Here's your row of soldiers with their guns, and here in the middle of it, just like I was in Colombia, in a way, in a funny way, here he was with his camera, pointing it here, pointing it there. There's a nice old man. Oh gosh, there's a little girl there digging in the mud because she has no food. And I sat, I was at university studying physics, and I thought, how could somebody stand there with a camera and film this little girl, if it had happened? It was the thing that stood out for me. She was so young, starved to death. Any moment she would be dead. The film was incredibly powerful. It certainly affected me. What I'm saying today and doing today has derived totally and absolutely from that film. When I was making the film in Colombia, I may have thought, gosh, well, this is good stuff. <laughs> this is really happening. Um, wow, terrific. This will fit perfectly with the stuff I shot the month before and this and that and the other. I was in the technicalities of making a film. It worked as a film. But the pretext, the premise right from the very beginning is I wanted to film a protest in America by the counterculture, let's call it, the way I had filmed protest in England, which, not without some irony, let's face it, was largely a film about America the war in Vietnam. 
I had started there making up for four, four films, I think it was, about the protest movement in America, in England, filmed with Bertrand Russell and a lot of other artists and various people, the Alder Master and March. I eventually ended up in New York and wanted to see what had happened eventually in America with those people who were trying to voice their rage, I might say. And um, I was hoping that I would make something that would move people and make them reflect, think twice, question things. I did not, to be honest, expect them to jump out of the window or go and ask Mark Rudd could they come along and be one of his band. Maybe some people did after Columbia, but I didn't think that my film would provoke that kind of action. For the start, it didn't come out a little while after the events. But um, I'll come on in a minute to the answering the next question of Catherine, which relates very much to the idea of the image and the word. I'll stop this answer, which is quite long, which was Catherine's first question, and I will make another move in editing her words to the next question. Here's a question that's on the list of questions from Catherine, which I'm sort of quite intrigued by. Is there anything you'd like to say to a room full of New Yorkers 47 years after you made the fall? Well, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not there with you. So we've answered that question. What do you think is the relationship between image and action, which I will elaborate on in a moment? Do you think what the students of Columbia did mattered? Well, to be honest, it wasn't my business to decide whether it did matter or not. Uh, I was just making a film about, which was a con continuation from the films I had been making and the books I had been writing in England. I had come to the source of the problem of the counterculture in England and America. I made a film called U.S. Us, which meant us, America, U.S., and us Brits. And it was again about the question of should we be participating? Should we be marching? Should we be demonstrating more violently? Or what? We didn't really know. When we were in England, I worked with the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation, secretly and privately, for Ralph Schoenberg. It was my job to edit films that were being sent out from North Vietnam. So I had a direct link to what was going on. I was not on the march. I was in my editing room, editing film images. As it happens, they didn't have words. But it was my job to put them in some kind of order and then they were sent around the world or to different people. I never knew where they went. I spent almost a year editing films from North Vietnam. I had seen what was going on there. I made a film with Bertrand Russell. But these films were shown at the New York Film Festival and then I was asked if I'd like to make a film about New York and I jumped at it not knowing, as I said earlier, at any point what the film was going to become by the time it was finished. But, notwithstanding and not having yet met Catherine, who probably wasn't born by then, I was already interested in the notion of using film as protest. Because it wasn't just entertainment anymore, it wasn't just information. It was crying out 
It was saying, listen, something's happening which shouldn't be happening. And I have captured it. I have filmed it. I was there. I want you to look at this. Now, this kind of thing, films like this made by an independent guy like me with a camera, who just ran around trying to get money and doing this and that and the other, were very rare in this time in the 60s. I was nevertheless interested in um, questioning my own role. This film, The Fall, is about me as much as the students in Colombia. It was about me as much as it is about the audience here watching the material of my film 46 years later. It does have power. It can change people. I don't think film, though, that often changes us from what we really are to something else totally different. Very rare. What it can often do is reinforce what we are, what we have doubts about. My film, The Fall, I might say, was shown, I don't know, when was it, a year ago? In the Occupy Wall Street time therein, I was rung up by... Um, Jeremy Veron, who's an academic, who said that I'm in contact with these people, they're occupying the Wall Street, we'd like to show the fall, and it was shown to these students. And I thought, well, it's fantastic, it's only been shown five times since I made it, and now it's in, in, in Wall Street, and I was thrilled to bits. My film had started its own life. It ceased really to have any contact with me. It was a film about America and Colombia, seen through the eyes of an English guy called Peter Whitehead. And um, I, I got quite a good feedback from some of the people who'd seen it. The Maisel Brothers, who I'm sure you know about if you're interested in film and protest, showed it then in the cinema. When it was shown, first of all, it was shown actually, I think it was projected under a wall, somewhere close to the... Um, I can't remember which square, one of the squares, it wasn't the Washington Square. Anyway, so I was very, very happy about that, because again it was saying, well, okay, what you've done is going to be valuable, always, because I've given it away. It's not me or anything anymore. It's a film called The Fall that people who are interested in that particular period could look at. Some might say, well, I'm a filmmaker, I want to see how he made this film. Others might say, well, listen, go on, what, what the hell was happening there? Does this show us anything more? It can do many things, but I mustn't cling to it. This is the most of the clinging I am prepared to do, this interview on my piano, um, because I don't think <clears throat> it has started. This film has started its own life. Um, it has been strong enough. It has an integrity and power that works as a film that has existed now for 46 years and I believe will exist forever because you can't take it away now. It is part of history. This film is history, as was, as were a number of other films that were made at the time, but I don't think anything quite as, um, what's the word? Well, let's say I'm very happy that the film is still alive, even though I have unfortunately been too busy writing books and doing other things to do much to encourage in it, it in its own life. Um, let's have a look at the life of the fall. Um, the first time I began to believe that having made the fall was a wonderful thing for me to have done because I'd made it, finished it, it had gone out and started its own life. I knew the woman who ran the Athens Film Society in Greece. I'd met her in London. She'd seen my films at the festivals, including The Fall, and liked in particular The Fall. She was a writer. Her sister was a famous dramatist. And um, she rang me from Athens and said, Peter, um, can we show your film? in the university. Now this was the time when Greece was in the grip of the so-called colonels. 
I'm sure you might know about it, some of you. The country was run after a military coup and it was half a bunch of lunatic colonels who ran the country. Well, Aglaya, Aglaya Metropolis said to me, yes, we'd like to show the film secretly inside Athens University to the students because there is talk of them occupying the university. I said, well, that's absolutely wonderful. I'll send you a print immediately. In those days it was print. Sent the print. Didn't hear, actually, anything for two or three weeks. Then um, Nikolai got back and said, amazing, it was wonderful. We showed it at night. All the students who were interested in this kind of thing came. We all sat and watched the American students in their moment of glory standing up inside Columbia University and saying, we've had enough. Things have to change. Well, two weeks later, these students went out onto the streets and started to march down the streets and were arrested by the colonels. The colonels didn't know what to do. They had another university joined in. To cut a long story short, within a month, anyone in Greece, and Athens in particular, who had aspirations of a revolution, let's call it, or, or doing finally being activists, daring to be activists, daring to be damaged in some way through doing what it was they were going to do, they did it. They went out onto the streets, occupied the streets, occupied the university. Within a month, the colonels were overthrown and arrested. Thanks to my showing the film, I hate to say, but I was very proud of this because after, about three months after, and the colonels were thrown out, they had a film festival in Thessalonica and they invited me and all my films to say thank you. We saw Peter Whitehead's film. I forget Peter Whitehead. We saw a film which had in it a bunch of young people and other people, activists, walking on the street who didn't even know they were activists, saying things have got to change. I don't like what is happening. And we created change. Thank you, Peter Whitehead. Well, Catherine Hamilton comes back from Istanbul a month ago and tells me, well, Peter, <laughs> you won't believe it, but we showed the fall in Istanbul. And I said, well, that's amazing, because, I mean, there's been absolute chaos, hasn't there? People, students being shot and God knows what else. It's almost like Kent University. She said, yes. Then we showed the fall in Istanbul. We'd been working together, a bunch of us, with other people from different fields and different backgrounds. We were determined, finally, not to sit around and watch television and YouTube. We wanted to do things that would be effective, somehow or another, in changing the minds, making people more certain that they have to do something. Looking around and saying, there's people over there, there's people over here, I know that person, gosh, he's in my football. And saying, right, let's get together. You know, we've got to do something about it. Well, the police heard about the showing, you may know about this, and raided the joint and stopped the projection of my film, which didn't belong to me anymore. It belonged to those people who decided to show it and see it, to celebrate it and enjoy it, and to come out afterwards and to do something with a little bit more enthusiasm and courage. Yes, we will do it. Fortunately, the police came and closed it down, the film, and tried to arrest everyone, which I don't think they succeeded in doing. But they closed it down three minutes before the end of the film. Well done, you guys. Well done. So it wasn't quite so much of a disaster. Don't tell anyone, but I think they're planning to show it again. I think you can tell them to show it, show it backwards and then yeah, having seen the... Anyway, the thing is that there you are, the film has begun its own life. It could have been... I didn't know about the is, is, uh, Istanbul showing. I didn't know any of the details of the Athens one, in, or, that, or, or too much detail about the 
Occupy Wall Street thing. Or they thought, all right, damn, great show, my film's done it again. It's going to be seen by a bunch of people who want to see it, not being persuaded by television adverts and this and that and the other, that they should eat Peter Whitehead's film, The Paul, because it's, for whatever reason, healthy to do so, etc., etc., that it is, in fact, an object that can be finally absorbed by the brain and the heart. It can cause things to happen. I believe it's much more powerful than words, which is why in the end, I hate to say it, having made the fall, I gave up filmmaking completely because I knew I personally had said all I could say on the subject and that I wanted to do something which I thought was even more powerful, you might be surprised, and that was to write novels. I'm not sure I made the right move. But I had decided, finally, that um, the kind of films that I was making were not going to be powerful enough. Which, by the way, is why when I edited the film before, I finally made it about assassination. I made it about someone who was prepared to shoot somebody else. Somebody who was prepared to actually sacrifice themselves. How many months later was it Kent University where students were shot dead? I think that ends that question and more. I'm asked about whether or not the students of Columbia, what they did mattered. What I did mattered. What did the heck does the word mattered mean? It matters to me enormously that the film has not just died somewhere. Very easily could have done. It was resurrected about five, six, seven more years ago because there was a retrospective of all my films. So actually it became part of all my films which you could say is a kind of a um, reduction, perhaps, of its power. But not necessarily. For example, in Vienna, it was shown with my other films. Therefore, they, it could be seen to be a film which was the logical extension of my other films. Tonight, it's all make love in London, Benefit of the Doubt, Holy Communion, and these other films, all of which were dealing, one way or another, the question of American imperial power, Americans' misuse of its money and its military might to take over not only its own children, but whole countries of other people's children. And they're still doing it, so I won't say any more about it. I'm sure I'll be penalised for it and they'll be raiding me here in my music studio, burning my piano. But they can't touch the film now, folks, because it has been digitalized so many times. It can never be erased. It never will be erased. Anyone who wants to study what happened in 1968 in New York in the field of revolution, insurrection, call it what you will, will have to see my film. And in my film, I do hope you agree with me, I have taken the step of putting myself in the film for a very particular reason, because I want the film to be about me, the filmmaker, with my camera, with my editing machine, with my girlfriend, with my crazy ideas that in fact it cannot just be bland and objective and neatly, neatly edited so that it looks like a soap advert. I wanted it to be rough. I wanted it to be a bit crazy, a bit mad. I wanted it to be passionate. When it was made, people couldn't read it. People in England and London wouldn't really sort of figure, couldn't figure it out. Now, <laughs> I mean, 
it looks like as if it was made yesterday actually, which is a good thing. And um, it can be read. It's in a language that is now readable, thanks to 40 years of progress with MTV and for instance, what else, and television itself, foreign independent television. I think the real question for me is, why is my film The Fall so relevant at this moment in Istanbul and New York? And the answer makes me very, very very sad. Things may have changed. Things may have been changed by my film and other films made by other people and other books written. But has it really changed? Has it changed enough? No. No. I'm under no illusion. But I was a filmmaker. I was a writer of books. I flung myself into the project of standing up against what I disliked. Tried to document it. Decided it wasn't enough. So I walked away and spent 20 years on the top of the highest mountain in the Middle East, breeding falcons. And you must admit that's a quite neat kind of a career change, really, for a chap who nearly got shot at Columbia University. End of question. said about as much as I dare say without becoming boring and repetitive. Anyway, um, if you see a university hanging around that looks as if it's falling apart, and there's quite a few in England falling apart, I can tell you, um, you know, just go and occupy it. Why not? We don't expect to read in the newspaper, the Sunday newspaper, of course, um, two weeks later, that the Americans have moved out of Afghanistan. I've travelled all around Afghanistan, not filming, but trapping falcons, much more interesting than filming. Thank you again for those two daring people who stood up on the stage and spoke. I'm very lucky, you see. There's a veil between me and what is happening. These words on a page by Catherine, hoping they will provoke me into saying something sensible or useful or I don't know quite. Anyway. Good luck with the film. Good luck with everything. Because it's only luck that we have left. And there's not much of it. We don't have hope anymore. So, I want to say thank you. One last word to our two actors on the stage from the audience because they have proved after all that a person can be both outside of the play and outside of the audience and inside the play and inside the audience at the same time. So perhaps they are a very good example of the subject of my film for one and the play for number two. They can now return to their seats in the audience and become ordinary, real victims of the mystery of theatre. Thank you.